Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome back, friends. I'm John Eldridge, and this is the climax and the last of our series here on Easter week, Palm Sunday to today, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. Let's pick up the story in Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. Ha! Christ has risen. The great trial is over. The greatest conquest has been won. Now, what do you suppose Jesus' mood is on this, his resurrection morning? We've been searching for the inner life of Jesus through these eight days. What is his inner life on this, the day of all days? Let's pick up the story in Luke chapter 24. Now, that same day, two of his disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened as they talked and discussed these things. Now, you understand, they don't know that Christ is risen. That's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about was his crucifixion by the Roman government, his betrayal by Judas, one of their own, the treacherous acts of the Sanhedrin, and then the death of their master, their teacher, their rabbi, the death of the one they thought would be the Messiah. That's what they're talking about. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. <laughs> Pause. You have got to be kidding. Here are two of Jesus' disciples, as grief-stricken as human hearts can be. They think he's dead. They think it's all over. If any moment cried out for good news from Jesus, this is one. And yet again, how casually he enters the scene, this time as a traveler with a flight to catch. He just sort of huffs up alongside, hiding himself, as he later does on the beach, to let this play out. He asks them what they're so upset about. Can you believe it? Cleopas can't, right? How is it possible that this stranger could have missed the things rocking Jerusalem the last few days? What things? Jesus inquires. Um, hello? If anyone knows what things, it is Jesus. These are his things, for heaven's sakes, his most important things ever. He feigns ignorance, and the story continues. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. 
They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Okay, now again, what is Jesus's overall mood this particular Sunday morning? Just a few hours ago, he walked out of the grave with the keys to hell swinging on his belt and the redemption of mankind in his pocket. Would it be safe to say he is cheerful, maybe even excited, jubilant? Christ is about as happy as anyone has ever been in the history of the world. But so far, he has only appeared to Mary Magdalene. Isn't the moment crying out for him to reveal himself to these shell-shocked followers? Look, it's me. I'm alive. Everything is going to be okay. Rejoice. Tell the world. He doesn't. He carries on with a disguise, apparently for some time, holding forth on highlights from the Old Testament as the three tramp along. And then comes this unbelievable moment. As they approached the village to which they were going, which is Emmaus, which is seven miles from Jerusalem, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. He acted as if he were going farther? Well, nice talking to you chaps. I'm so sorry for your loss. Hope things turn out, but I've got to get going. (laughs) What? What in the world? Christ takes up the role of a thespian, pretending to have to move on so that they have to beg him to stay? Oh, all right, if you insist. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. (laughs) Oh, friends, what do you make of this story? Jesus' behavior is either A, bizarre, B, meant to drive home some spiritual lesson about trusting Christ when we don't see him, which, taken in the timing, this is the first thing he does after resurrecting, and his play acting and the grief of his followers is even frankly, more bizarre. Or C, his actions are playful. Given that this is the God of a playful creation, on his resurrection morn, he who has been so playful with his followers in their years together, whom we see playing the inside joke on his closest friends a week from now when he does the miraculous catch a fish on the beach, I'm putting my money on playful. We've been looking for the inner life of Jesus. He has descended into hell. He has rescued Adam and Eve. He has rescued his saints from the ages. He has broken the power of death. He's walked out of the tomb this morning. And the first thing he does is sneak up alongside two random followers who are kind of slumping back to this town called Emmaus. (laughs) Oh, friends, only joy, only joy can interpret this story for you. Anything else is just creepy, religious, bizarre stuff. Okay, and stay with the story now. Going on in Luke 24. So here's what happens. Christ reveals himself and then disappears, which is just, it can only be interpreted in the light of joy. All right. so. These two guys, Cleopas and his unnamed friend, it says they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, you understand it's probably dark by now. They got seven miles to go back. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together. And they said, it's true. The Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two from the Emmaus Road told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Okay, so just picture this moment. You have the disciples gathered together. They're still somewhat incredulous. I mean, yeah, you know, the girls saw the angel and he spoke to them and Mary Magdalene had a personal encounter with Christ in the garden. So she has seen him and then he's appeared to Peter. But 
they're still trying to piece together what's going on because Jesus is not there right now at this moment. And then these two come bursting in from the Emmaus Road with this crazy story of, wait, he did what? Jesus, he snuck up alongside of you, like dressed like somebody else? And they're like, yeah, we didn't recognize him. And and then he talked to you about what? Well, he acted like he didn't know what happened the last three days here. Yeah, I don't know why he did that. And then they're like, wait, wait, this last piece. He acted as if he had to go on to a different village and you had to beg him to stay with you? They're like, yeah, yeah, that's what happened. It's at that moment, right here, the next verse, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. (laughs) I love this moment. It says they were startled. And frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Peace be with you? you got to be kidding me, right? I mean, here it is. Here's the moment to, like, bring it all together and connect the dots and, you know, solidify their faith and embrace one another in joy. And Jesus, the master of understatement, just says, hello. (laughs) As if to say, yep, that was me. Yep, I did it just like that. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement. Okay, he's going to try one more thing then. He says, do you have anything here to eat? Oh, my goodness. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence, kind of waiting for everyone to digest the lesson, right? Oh, friends, what is the inner life of Jesus on Easter? It's not religious. It's not lessons and scriptures and sermons. It's not stained glass. What is the inner mood of Jesus on his resurrection Sunday. It's joy, friends. It's joy. It is utter, absolute, triumphant joy. And so one of my favorite poets, the old English poet George Herbert, in his poem on Easter, says this, Rise, heart. Thy Lord is risen. And I give that to you as a benediction and as an urging and as a triumphant call. Rise, hearts, rise. Thy Lord is risen. So glad that you have joined us through these eight days as we've explored something of the inner world of Jesus through Easter week. You obviously have been listening to the Ransom Tart Podcast. Love to have you join us weekly. We release our podcast on Mondays. And love to have you share this with your friends. Tell them to come and listen to this. Spread the word. Spread the joy. Rise, hearts. Thy Lord is risen.